Like a lot of you, I wanted to record some of my full driving trips and touring trips with my dash cam, but also wanted to use it as a layer of security when I'm driving around town. So which dash cam did I go for? I'll tell you that after this. So after looking around at a heap of different dash cams, including the four-wheel drive Supercenter $79 Chinese Special, the Garmin dash cam 45 and 55, the Mobius um, sports camera that people use as dash cams, I eventually settled on the A119 by VFO. Now this is the version two, but it's not the newer S or Pro version because apparently this one here has slightly better footage. I have seen some reviews on YouTube and it does appear that this is more closely aligned to what I want. This doesn't have Wi-Fi like the Mobius or the uh, Garmin dash cams, and that is a little bit of a pain, but I think being able to pull the SD card out is gonna be just fine for getting my footage off and putting it onto my laptop. What I like about this particular dash cam is that it comes factory with the capacitor style charge rather than a lithium battery. And that means in the hot West Australian summers, we're not gonna have reliability issues with lithium ion batteries expanding or failing. The other thing is that this has a screen, unlike the Mobius, and even though I'm not gonna use that a lot of the time, it means that I can just push the button to turn it on when I'm about to do something very cool in the four-wheel drive and make sure that I capture it. This does have an optional GPS, and I didn't buy that option on this. I'm not that keen on people knowing how fast I'm going at any particular point in time, but I did get the optional circular polarizing filter, which should reduce a heap of glare off the windscreen and make footage with overcast conditions look better. It's actually one of the primary reasons why I went with this particular dash cam in the end. I also bought the hardwire kit for it because I don't like cigarette lighter plugs and also because that will allow me to use the built-in parking mode in this where it can drop down to one frame per second and take a time lapse while the vehicle's parked. Because the solar panel's on top of the Patrol, it should be able to power this almost indefinitely, although the hardware kit does come with, with a neat little low voltage cutoff switch. So in this video, we're going to have a look at what comes in the box and then I'm gonna show you how I hardwired it into the Patrol. Then I'm gonna take it for a little bit of a drive and show you some of the footage. So inside the box, we have the dash cam itself, the A119, and we also have a whole bunch of accessories underneath. Now, the book I found in this particular uh, instance to be not very helpful at all, uh, but there are plenty of YouTube videos on how the A119 works if you need more assistance. So we have a USB to cigarette lighter adapter with a dual USB plug, which is actually quite handy if you're planning to do it that way. And uh, we've also got a couple of mounts with some decent quality 3M double-sided tape on them. This doesn't use a suction cup. It's also got some uh, USB cables and some clamps to hold your cables to the windscreen if that's the way you want to go. And because I wanted to use the parking mode on this particular dash cam, I purchased this additional low voltage cutout hard wiring kit that was available uh, from the same online seller as I bought the dash cam. And of course the circular polarizing filter that I spoke about earlier, which I am really looking forward to see how it works. It is a fairly simple arrangement. It just snaps straight onto the front of the dash cam and seems to be a fairly simple fit. The low voltage cutout hardwire kit seems to be fairly straightforward. That's the low voltage cutout system there. And then it has three wires attached to it. It has a accessories, a constant 12 volt power and an earth lead. And they all go through the voltage cutout module and then head into the USB mini connector that goes into the dash cam. Because this dash cam uses 3M double sided tape, I'm using methylated spirits to clean the windscreen first and make sure there's no oily residue on the windscreen, which will also help with the visibility of the dash cam once it's installed. Once you're ready, you need to pull the cover off the double-sided tape and stick it to the windscreen, but you really wanna make sure that it's in the right spot first. So I've just run the USB lead 
from my stereo system to the dash cam to give it some power so that I can see on the screen how it's going to look before I actually stick it onto the screen. If you stick this to the screen and it's not in the right space, you're going to find it very difficult to remove it and reattach it. Now because I'm hardwiring this, I'm going to need to remove the kick panel. I've chosen to go down the passenger side because I've already got a lot of gear going down the driver's side with my EGT gauges and boost gauges and a GPS power and that sort of thing. So removing the kick panel and the trim around there and then finally pulling the door seal off and you can see I've already got a cable running up there. Now normally you would find your accessory power from tapping into either a cigarette lighter or the back of your stereo system but I've already got a switch here that I use for switching accessory power on manually when I'm camping so I already have constant power and earth and accessory power all at this one switch so that's where I'm going to be going today. I'm going to tape this up with black electrical tape just in a couple of sections along here to make it easier to run. Having these three wires all loose is going to be difficult to get a nice neat job behind the dash there. And I'm also going to use the electrical tape to tie that around a cable tie to help me feed that through under the glove box without it getting caught up on too many other bits and pieces. Now the cable tie worked well for getting that through under the dash but it just didn't have the rigidity to feed it up to where my switch is so I opted to get some heavy electrical cable and take the cable tie to that after feeding the cable down and then I could pull the loom up to where the switch is. This seemed to be the easiest way to do it in this particular situation. I do have a fair few wires running behind there as it is so it is kind of a bit of a tricky spot to work. Now that I've got the cable loom up to where the switch is, I need to go through and undo all of that tape that I put on there and then start cutting off the connectors that came with the loom in the bag. They're not going to be any good to me because I'm going to be using my own crimp connectors for the earth and then soldering on my accessory power and constant power to the existing wires that are going to the switch. When crimping electrical connectors for automotive use I always like to solder them as well and it's a good idea if you can to use heat shrink with glue attached to it to really make sure that they don't wiggle loose. Unfortunately in this instance I'd run out of the correct size heat shrink for this particular plug so what I am going to do is just put a little bit over the end of the connector so that it doesn't short out on the positives on the switch if I'm going over bumps with the four-wheel drive. So now I just need to use my multimeter to find out which of these two terminals is the accessory switched power and which is the constant power. Plug my earth into the switch and then I can go ahead and get ready to splice in the two remaining cables for the dash cam. I simply use my wire stripping tool to just put a break in the sheath and then push it back with the tool itself gives me just a little bit of exposed wire which I can then wrap my new cable around and solder it on with my soldering iron. The only downside to doing it this way is that you can't use heat shrink and you just have to wrap electrical tape around it but provided that you do a neat job on that, it shouldn't pose any problems. So it's just a matter of repeating this process once again. I always double check my connections with the multimeter before I start and go ahead and wire up the last connector for the dash cam power. Before going to all the effort of running the cable all the way up and over to the dash cam, I'm going to make sure that it works by just plugging the dash cam in and powering it up. Now I've just got to remove the trim where the grab handle is on the passenger side and that will allow me to get the cable up from where I was working earlier in this video. It's a simple matter of unscrewing two Phillips screws and then just 
undoing the or pulling the two clips away from the body of the car. You just run your cable up through there along the roof lining at the top of the windscreen. Just jam it up in there the best you can and then you'll have to go through and put some silicon uh, where it comes out at the dash cam to stop it coming loose at a later time once you've got it where you want it to stay. Then just simply put the trim back on and do the two Phillips screws back up. Make sure you tighten them up properly with a screwdriver. And then we're uh, ready to start putting the trim all back together and we're pretty much ready to go. It actually looks quite neat. I mean, I've got a, a light shining on the back of it there so that you can see it, but it's quite stealthy from the front of the vehicle and it's not impeding my vision too much at all when from the driver's seat. You can see the screen if you need to, but you have very easy access to the emergency button if you want to record an incident. So how does it stack up? Well, this is a pretty glary afternoon coming home from work. It's actually quite a challenging bit of footage for any camera to capture and you can see that it's not too bad at all. The number plates while moving will be tricky I think. It is quite possible to get a clear still with the raw footage. The YouTube compression has really made that a little bit uh, worse than it, it is in real life but if you were both doing 110 k's an hour it would be uh, probably fairly impossible to make out a number plate of a passing vehicle but in an incident where you're in a low speed crash or uh, the other car was stopped. I think it's actually quite feasible that you'd be able to read license plates without any dramas at all. The low light footage is actually pretty impressive. Uh, it doesn't seem to be a huge amount of noise and even with the really poor high low beam headlights on the Nissan Patrol Series 2 it's uh, acceptable and you can see what's going on. Obviously the LED spotlights and light bar really bring that home but uh, even if you're just driving along with low beam, it's still quite adequate. Even out on the highway in lower light settings, the shutter speed doesn't seem to be causing too much blur. I'm not sure what the shutter speed is on this particular camera, but at 110 kilometers an hour, you're still getting a fairly crisp picture, even in these lower light situations. So am I happy? Well, Considering how challenging the environments are that I've been filming so far, yeah, I think it's doing a really great job. It'll be really interesting to see the quality of it when I get some nicer weather. Um, and I think from what we've got so far, I should be able to use some of that footage in my videos moving forward, which will be uh, really nice and allow me to use my GoPros for more interesting uh, B-roll shots. Will it uh, be reliable? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, the heat is going to be a, a real challenge for it in Western Australia, so if I'm going to have a problem, um, it's going to be in the summer. So I'll let you know if that happens, uh, but in the meantime, uh, we'll just use it and see, uh, see how good that footage is in uh, some upcoming videos.